Hi everyone, Adam Steele from Hot Pole Studios here. And last time that you saw me do a video for a Lewitt microphone, that was a sponsored video talking about the six... The... Talking about the DTP 640 Rex microphone and showing what that can do other than just be a kick drum microphone. This, however, is not a sponsored video. This is the 440 Pure Mic, and this is me telling you my honest opinion of what I think of this. Stick around. So the microphone that you're hearing right now is the 440 Pure. Uh, the My normal voiceover mic is not plugged in right now, the Sennheiser 416. And as you can probably hear the chair squeaking, that's just me being... Uh, uh, that's why I'm on black coffee, I'm trying to cut down on the weight. Uh, this thing has actually really impressed me. Um, let's go back a little bit. So... My first impression of Lewitt as a whole was not great. And that's certainly not their fault, but it's probably worth me saying to say this is uh, my objective attempt at a fair and balanced review. Uh, so first time I tried a Lewitt microphone, it was one of their kick drum mics. It wasn't the 640 Rex. And it was one of their big fat kick drum mics and I tried it and it sucked. And I couldn't get any low end out of it. There was really low output. Uh, on reflection, it must have been broken because I've talked to a couple of other people since who had that model of microphone and their experiences were nothing like the one that I had. So fair enough. It seems that the impression that was given to me was because of something that had been broken. Uh, and so that stuck in my mind, though, is I always thought, you know, Lewitt, nah, 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 I'm not going to. So the, the reason that I'm saying this is that I can't be the only one who's had a bad experience that puts them off some brand for a reason. And so while I was out at 42 Gear Street a little while ago, uh, which was at Henning Pauly's place, uh, the guys from Lewitt were there. Wonderful people, got to know them. And so we got chatting. I did a video with their new prototype valve microphone, uh, which was rather nice. And we worked out a deal where I would do a video on the DTP 640 Rex showing its uh, things that it can do, that it's multi, you know, it's multi purpose and it, it, it kind of, it's billed as just a kick drum mic. But that that's felt like the kind of video that I could do something justice without, you know, having to fawn all over the microphone and be like, oh, it's the best thing ever because the focus of that video was showing you the microphone's different applications and the way that it's designed, the, the way that it can be used in different circumstances, which I thought was a cool angle to take. As it so happens... Um, when we came to do the video that was uh, there's a link here that was uh, it was uh, a cover of a Nora Jones song I can't actually play any of that in this video because that would uh, trigger the copyright flags and all that kind of thing and so we needed a microphone to put on the acoustic guitar and so I asked Valerie from Lewitt what do you have and she brought out a 440 Pure. And I stuck it on the acoustic guitar 12 inches away. I uh, didn't think any more of it. And then I listened back in the edit uh, a week later because I didn't have any chance to edit while I was there. And I was incredibly impressed with the sound that we got out of that acoustic guitar, considering that I was six feet away wailing and just giving it the... Blah. But I will give you a tiny little snippet of that acoustic guitar here. Like a flower. And so that really 
impressed me, so I asked uh, the guys from Lewitt to send me one of these for an unbiased and fair review. So, you know, if there's anything bad that I find out about it, I'm going to say. And so far, I have been incredibly impressed, uh, especially when I take into account the price point. Now, I will talk about the price point more at the end of this video, but this is through the lens of looking at a microphone that cost me £200 to £250 if I want to buy one. Uh, because, yeah, like I say, they, they sent me this microphone for review, but I'm always needing new microphones and there's every chance that if this comes uh, high up on my list, I might buy a second one. Um, I just went out and bought... Uh, a microphone from Extinct Audio, which I reviewed a little while back and was so impressed by that that I just had to go and buy one. You know, it's it's a, it's an operating cost of a recording studio. It's part of the, the business. It's what we do. So, yeah, don't be swayed by the fact that that I, I was sent this, this mic for a review. If I don't like it, I'll say. And you won't see it in any other videos in future. That's the other thing, if I don't like it. That's always a good way to tell whether an engineer says one thing and does another. Now, uh, as for the voiceover sound, you've been hearing this the whole time. If you like the sound of this voice, this is running through uh, Voxengo's Voxformer, which is giving some compression, a bit of light EQ, uh, a bit of gating and de -essing. So it is being processed, this particular sound, uh, but then it's no different from when I have the voice processed from my usual voiceover mic. And I have to say, I am very impressed with this. I very, very slightly prefer the sound of my Sennheiser MKH416 for voiceover, and arguably I should. That's the that's what it's for. It's one it's kind of a an RF biased uh, voiceover boom mic difference is this costs from 200 to 250 pounds depending on where you buy them new if you want one of those sennheisers they are 900 pounds so if you get a good deal on these you can buy four of them and still have some change for the price of one of those that's big so i mean for the slight sound difference there i i have to say uh going well so far. Let's talk tech specs for a second, uh, because this thing on paper has a self-noise, and every powered microphone has self-noise, of 7 dBA. Now, a lot of the uh, self-powered microphones that I've used have got somewhere between 50 and 20 dBA of self-noise, and 7 dBA is ridiculously quiet, which means it's going to be able to pick up really, really sensitive, quiet performances as long as the room itself is quiet without the actual microphone uh, causing too much background noise. So let's listen to this microphone now on an acoustic guitar part that I'm just going to play in the other room and I'm going to play quite quietly with my fingers. Usually I'm quite apprehensive to do that with a lot of microphones because the background noise can creep in, but you're probably more likely to hear me breathing and fidgeting than you are to hear microphone hissing. And you'll get to hear the overall tone of the microphone because I won't uh, put any processing on that. Warm things, warm places, keep you safe, keep you Step outside, look at trees, look at berries, with two brimming eyes, it's a breeze to be merry, standing takes an age, so the world becomes real, 
long in one slow gaze living through this real and it's only a matter of time cause the dog box beckons you home where a warm thing is waiting cold life feet first the berries can go warm things warm places keep you safe keep you Sounds good to me. And the reason I think, and again, I'm going to talk tech specs for a second. I'm just going to swing around and change the camera angle. What have I done here? There we go. So what you can see on screen is the frequency response, not of this microphone, but of the lower end microphone, the 240. And the reason that I'm looking at this is if you can see here, there's a big bump at kind of seven kilohertz now to me that is the sound generally of a cheap condenser microphone because what they're trying to do with that design for really cheap microphones is use uh, a presence bump that makes it sound hi-fi and crystal clear and professional but what actually happens is that in the context of an actual professional recording, that kind of sweetener to the ear can come across as harsh. You can end up with some really overbearing S's and that extra brightness, unless it's something you're specifically looking for, can really be quite overbearing. Now, let's switch this to the frequency response of the 440 Pure. And now you can see that it's a very different top end here. So there's a slight bump around 4K, which is kind of, it can be quite scratchy of a sound, but it's only a three decibel bump, uh, where some mics will go way higher. And then there isn't that 7K bump, but there is a distinct frequency lift around 12, 12 and a half K, which is what I would call the air region. And so that's why this microphone sounds quite clear, but doesn't have a very strident piercing top end because it doesn't have that 7K thing going on, at least not as a specific standout dip. And that to me makes all the difference in the world. To me, a lot of modern microphone manufacturers, especially on the cheaper end of things, are desperately trying to impress uh, people who don't necessarily know any better and by 
doing the whole brightness peak thing, you listen and your first impression is, this is really good. Because brighter to the ear generally means better. At least it does at first. When you start adding sources together, you know, electric guitars, cymbals, vocals, you start to get a build-up of frequencies. And the build-up of that 7K thing really starts to hurt the ears and becomes quite offensive quite quickly. Whereas a lot of sources, like uh, electric guitar, for example, don't have a lot of information going on in that 12K region higher up, which means that that nice air on the vocal and the nice shine on cymbals, if I was to use two of these on overheads, say, uh, means that that would sound nice, but would build up in a whole different region. Uh, my personal experience of sibilance on vocalists, the worst is usually between five and seven or eight kilohertz. So if you're not accenting that, you're not pulling out the sibilance, but you can have that nice airy top end. And so that's what we're going to show you now is a little bit of me making up some words. I'm in the process right now, and you might have already seen the live stream of making a song for one of my friends, uh, Ben. Uh, Ben's uh, Twitch channel is uh, really doing well. He does things like Pokemon streams and Magic the Gathering and all sorts of cool stuff. And he's commissioned me to make a song for him. The song was an instrumental, but just for the purposes of this video, I'm adding some uh, vocals uh, with a nice little bit of harmony uh, using the 440 Pure. All in all, fairly impressive. Um, I had a clue that I was going to be impressed by this because the first time I heard this mic, I didn't know it, uh, was Andy Ferris, the guitar geek, did a song for 42 Gear Street. That we're going to Deutschland, we're going to Germany. And the vocals really sounded quite upfront and polished and forward. And he said that he'd used the 440 with just minimal processing it was just pretty much there and ready and that is really impressive for a microphone and again i'm coming back to the price point so if i can get this for 200 pounds we're looking at competition like some of the lower end audio technica stuff uh, aston origin or maybe even the aston spirit depending on the price uh, we're looking at that kind of region of just above entry level and I mean there's also Rode have got the NT1 in that category uh, we're looking at really clean sounding large diaphragm condensers because up in the higher price brackets you start to get into what I would call character you start to get into using valves or transformers or the weird and wonderful slightly vintage technology to get a much more thick sound that might be described as vintage at uh, lewitt themselves are making the 1040 prototype right now uh, we're talking with the expensive stuff stuff like a neumann u87 which has a big fat transformer in it or we're talking um something like uh, a neumann again u47 which has a big valve this has none of those things but it's not designed to be that uh, but what it does come with is the case candy so to speak and it's the little details at this price point that really impress me details like uh if you look at the front of the uh, shock mount here and the shock mount is included in the price good start um it uses nice thick uh, rubber you know cords bands to suspend the microphone and it's one of those suspensions where it just kind of clicks in you don't wind it and wind it and wind it for days but if you look at the front of it uh they stop it so it's like a horseshoe shape now if you've ever thought that was just for aesthetics no there's a reason and the reason is if i was to stick this on a guitar cabinet 
Um, usually with the big round kind of uh, spider mount, shock mounts, the big round bit at the front means you can only get so close to a guitar cabinet before you're getting that shock mount, b- bumping it up against the cloth of the amp which can be a real pain for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it means that you might not not necessarily be able to get the microphone in where you want it. And secondly, if you do get the mic where you want it, the uh, shock mount might be pressing up against the grill, uh, which means potential damage to the grill or um, even worse, vibrations from the cabinet going through the shock mount and essentially rattling the microphone and causing extra strange sound artifacts, which would really... You might not pick up on during tracking, but when you mix it, you're going to hear the weird stuff. <laughs> it's, you know, those are consequences that can be uh, solved by just not having that front on the shock mount. They're not the only brand, Lewitt, that I've seen to do that, uh, but I'm always impressed by companies who go the extra mile with the designs. The other thing that impressed me is this thing, which if I just lift this off, I'll cut the microphone while I do it. This is a pop filter that they include. It's a metal pop filter, small, efficient. Uh, It clicks on with magnets. Genius. You just kind of drop it on and that's it. And the magnets are strong enough that you can hold it upside down, give it a good shake. The pop filter isn't coming off. Now, personally, I think that this pop filter is far too close to the capsule to be the be all and end all. But uh, quite often, if I'm recording a particularly enunciating pop or rock or R&B singer, uh, then I'll usually have two pop filters in front of the microphone anyway. Uh, One to catch the majority of the air and one just as an extra safeguard because you really don't want a key performance being destroyed. Uh, This would mean that I would only need to use one external pop filter that I would also then be able to use as a marker for the singer's distance. So if I want them to be three inches away, four inches away, that means that that spacing, I don't need to worry about a second one and a second gooseneck clanging around and bashing into things because each time you put another pop filter with a gooseneck in there, you are adding another layer of... A potential problem in terms of something that a singer can knock and make noise with. Ugh. The design is very, very cool in the way that there are different layers of metal with holes in for mesh uh, rather than any sort of cloth or anything like that. And it looks like it's been really cleverly designed so that there are two layers on the microphone. One is further back than the big, the big holes and the small holes. They're separate. And then the tiny, tiny holes in the pop filter mean that different frequencies and different uh, low-end amounts will get stopped at different points. Very, very clever. And however they've done it, they've done it in such a way that they've not had to bump the price up to a stupid amount. Now, what they have done, I can see, that keeps the price down is there are no switches, there are no options. Uh, They've designed the mic, as far as I can tell, uh, to take ridiculously high volume levels, uh, but there's no switch for a pad. There's no internal pad switch anywhere. There's no low cut switch anywhere. There's no polar pattern changing. There's no option for anything. And as a result, you get what you get. And that's your lot. And interestingly enough, Lewitt do do... Uh, He said doo-doo. Yes, I'm turning into Henning. Um, They make microphones that cost more that have those options in. And I would imagine that if you really, really want those options, then the extra money is going to be worth it for you. But this is the thing about microphone design and price points, as far as I always see it, is that If I see a reasonably priced microphone that has loads and loads of options, I immediately get suspicious. Because to put in all those choices and all those components and all those extra switches, all that kind of stuff, somewhere corners have had to be cut to make the price point and still turn a profit. Because let's be honest, microphone manufacturers and gear manufacturers of all kinds, 
want to make a profit. That's why they do this. And so, yeah, the, the, the way they've done this, there's no like light up LED in it or anything, which I would have liked. Oh, that would have been nice, but you know, I can live without it. It doesn't change the sound. Uh, yeah, there's, I would have liked to have seen a pad switch, but then if this is a transformerless design and that means that this won't saturate as you absolutely blast it with volume, then you don't need a pad as long as your interface has a pad. Uh, then like, um, I'm actually running this right now into a Behringer UMC 404 HD because that's what's over on the streaming setup right now uh, in lieu of a higher end uh, interface, which I'm sure one will be in there eventually. Uh, but that does have pads on each input. I'm not using it right now, but the gain isn't particularly high. If I padded that and blasted this, it probably wouldn't sound too different. And that's a good thing because, yeah, vintage microphones with tubes or transformers, the pad on the microphone, if there is one, generally tends to come between the capsule and the tubes, transformers, all that kind of circuitry because otherwise those will distort in a nasty kind of way on things like roaring guitar cabs or bass cabs or a vocal that's really blasting that big operatic kind of thing. And if they've designed the microphone so it's not going to do that anyway, then yeah, maybe the pad isn't needed after all. As for the low cut, that is something that I feel is missing. And if they did a 440 Pure Mark II, that is something I would like to see because, I mean, this shock mount is supposed to uh, separate things, but listen closely if I just tap the stand. That's a lot of low end. Uh, transferring through the shock mount and in a lot of applications I mean yeah a lot of the time you can take that out at the interface preamp stage or even in a in a mix but being able to take it out at the microphone stage uh, means that I know that the levels aren't going to clip anywhere because a lot of level on meters is low end the lower you go every octave you go down the amount of power doubles so the amount of volume goes up. If you can shelve out unnecessary uh, stuff, yeah, that's a, that's something that's well worth looking at. But all in all, I have to say, good job, Lewitt. Uh, the other thing that I noticed in the box is this comes in a cardboard box. Uh, it comes with a one of those faux leather pouches kind of like a you know an sm57 or something would come in one of those leather pouch type things and that's one of the ways that they've kept the price down and i like that as well because you do see companies that will give you a nice pretty wooden box and that kind of thing when you're paying two thousand pounds for a microphone and you get a nice wooden box or a nice hardy flight case yeah, I mean, that probably cost £100 out of the 2000 to make the box or the flight case. And at that level, I would probably expect that to look after the microphone. But with something at this price point, I would have them in that full of the bag and then I would probably store those in like a big microphone locker thing anyway as go-tos uh, if I was a live sound engineer I might use these as overheads in fact you can use these on guitar cabs really well I might do that live uh, they seem pretty tough uh, although time will tell with that but at this price point I'm not white with fear at the idea of taking one of these out live if it was a £2,000 microphone it would stay in the studio but for 200 quid. Yeah, I mean, that's on the upper end of what I would pay for a microphone that I would take out live. But it sounds like this. So, you know, I mean, I wouldn't use this as a, a vocal mic in a live setup, but maybe as a drum overhead or as a, a guitar cab mic. I don't think I'd have a problem with that. But then if it was a guitar cab, I probably would use the 640 Rex because that thing's an absolute beast and has the dynamic and condenser thing in, in the same. But then some sound guys are going to get funny about you giving them two inputs. and, oh, But yeah, I would definitely go out and get one of these. 
Uh, there are links in the description, right at the top of the description, if you do want to go and get one of these. And they are affiliate links, of course, on Toman. And uh, currently Amazon, but that might change. Uh, but if you decide to go and buy something else instead, then do click one of the links in the description because that still helps us out. Uh, there's no particular incentive for me to tell you to buy one of these over another brand, uh, which is always helpful because that's another way that I can say this is uh, you know balanced. But in its price point, definite 9 out of 10 for one of these. The 10 out of 10 is incredibly elusive. I have yet to see a 10 out of 10 at the £200 price range. There's always time. Thank you everybody for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Subscribe, do the Patreon thing, hit the like button, everything. Cheers everybody. See you later. Hey everyone, that might be the end of the video, but if you fancy carrying on this conversation, we have a Discord server. Link is in the description. We're also on Patreon, which is something you can really help us with. We also are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Hot Pole Studios. See you there.